These are my hands-on first impressions of the Sony FX6. Welcome to CineD, I'm Nino and today I'm sharing my thoughts on the newly announced Sony FX6, which I was able to use for a few days. Mind you that we had access to a pre-production version of the camera with an early firmware. The FX6 looks like a mini version of the FX9 and it's easy to compare the two to the Sony FS7 and FS5. The FS5 really was a spec down version of the FS7 with a weaker codec. The quality differences in recording between the FX9 and FX6 are less distinct, however, let's get to this a little bit later. First, let's look at the FX6 itself. The camera body itself is tiny. When you take off the top and side handles, you're left with a little lightweight box that can easily be put in all kinds of small shooting spaces or on a gimbal, for example. To me personally, the form factor feels close to perfect. It's super easy to adjust the handle to almost any position and it's also easy to reposition the monitor to various mounting points on the body. It weighs next to nothing, but it's not like you're missing any features from it. The famous electronic variable ND filter is in there as well and this is something that is still unique to Sony cameras. It allows you to adjust the ND intensity stepless without any color shift. Compared to the similarly sized FS5, the two XLR ports have moved back up into the detachable handle. I personally was a fan of the positioning in the FS5, where one XLR port was in the body itself, because it meant you don't lose all audio inputs when you detach the handle. However, unfortunately, that is again the case with the FX6. You're left only with a low quality built-in microphone in the body. There isn't even a mini jack input. Nevertheless, the FX6 has a timecode in and out port in the body itself, which is hugely useful for professional productions. And that means you can attach something like a tentacle sync timecode box to sync up with your external audio recording or other cameras. The button layout on the side of the camera is intuitive and will be familiar to many Sony users. Sony has a new quick menu in the FX6 that shows up when you press the menu button once. And it's essentially 10 pages of the most needed functions laid out in a grid form. While I was quite excited about this when I saw it for the first time, and it's also available in the FX9 by the way, I have to say that it still needs a bit of more work from Sony until it becomes really useful. Unfortunately, the FX6 doesn't come with a built-in EVF, but it comes with a screen, and that screen is identical to the one from the FX9. It's 720p resolution and a touch screen, however, don't expect the same responsiveness for touch that you're used to from an A7S III, for example. While the camera has the same amazing facial recognition autofocus from the FX9, which works just as well, it doesn't share the touch tracking functionality from the A7S III, which is quite useful. In general, think of the Sony FX6 as an A7S III sensor in the Pro video body. Sony could not confirm, but I'm almost 100% certain they took the sensor and other technologies from the A7S III and combined it with the best from the FX9. And yes, that also means that the FX6 seems to be an absolute low light beast. Now we haven't finished a side by side yet, as we didn't have the FX6 quite long enough but my feeling is that the better processing of the camera actually produces even cleaner low light images than the A7S III itself. That would make the FX6 probably the most capable low light camera on the market. In our A7S III lab test, we measured quite exceptional dynamic range and very low rolling shutter. And I will bet my left arm that we will see similar results in our FX6 lab test once we test the production models. The 10.2 megapixel sensor in the FX6 is a native 4K resolution sensor, not the 6K sensor from the FX9 which gets downsampled to 4K. That means that the FX9 still retains more detail, but in both cases you end up with a 4K image recorded into the XAVC-I intraframe and XAVC-L long gob codecs. Yes, the FX6 records in the same codecs as the FX9, not the ones from the A7S III. And you also have, of course, S-Log3, but also S-Cinetone available in the FX6, just like on the FX9. In terms of recording media, the FX6 takes the same cards as an A7S III, SD cards V90 or CF Express Type A cards, so no more XQD cards like in the FX9 or the FS7 series. 
Unlike the A7S III, the FX6 does not feature in-body stabilization. We have been told by Sony before that it's impossible to have IBIS in a camera with a built-in mechanical ND. However, like with the FX9, the FX6 has a gyroscope built into the camera and it records the movements of the camera in space. Using Sony's own Catalyst software, you can apply post-stabilization using that data. Now let's move on to frame rates. The FX9 cannot do a full-frame sensor readout and record that at 4K in 50 or 60p, which is why Sony introduced a 5K crop mode using around 83% of the sensor, which will record 4K in 50 or 60p. Now, to my personal frustration as an FX9 owner, the FX6 can record the full-frame sensor at 50 or 60p without any problem. In fact, it can go much higher than that. In SNQ mode, Sony's own high-speed recording mode for slow motion, we can achieve up to 120 frames per second in 4K with a full sensor readout without any crop whatsoever, just like with an A7S III. And that is really impressive. And to make things even better, the autofocus works on the FX6 in most high-speed modes. When shooting with a 25p time base, the autofocus works at up to 100 frames per second, and with a 2997 time base, it works up to 120 frames per second, which is a bit confusing. In HD resolution, the FX6 can record a whopping 240 frames per second without any crop. And the autofocus functionality also depends on the base frame rate in HD. Now compare that with the FX9. Much lower high frame rates, only 30p without crop full sensor readout. And no autofocus whatsoever once you go into the SNQ high speed recording modes. Now, to be frank, as someone who bought an FX9, I'm not too happy about this. That camera costs twice as much as an FX6 and, talking about that, we should really look at what you need to output RAW from the FX9. The optional 2.500 Euro XDCA FX9 adapter. Yes, it also has other functions, but you will still need to purchase it if you want to record RAW from that camera. Now, what about the FX6 and RAW? No accessories required. You can output RAW directly from the camera to an Atomos recorder to record ProRes RAW. Another thing that doesn't make an FX9 customer too happy. And did I mention the low light? Also considerably better on the FX6. Now there is one big caveat on all that with the FX6. It does not have a super 35mm crop mode in 4K resolution. You can only crop to S35 in HD and this is down to the native 4K resolution of the sensor. That of course effectively means that you cannot use a lot of legacy glass with that camera. Now putting my own feelings about the comparison with the FX9 aside, the FX6 is truly an exceptional camera. I will still have to put a production version through its paces. But from what I've seen so far and experienced so far, for me personally, this is very close to the perfect camera. It's small, it's lightweight, it has almost all the codec options and frame rates I would ever need. It has amazing autofocus and it's practically a night vision camera. I go so far to predict that the Sony FX6 will become the true successor of the FS7 in productions all over the world. Yes, the FX9 still has some functions, like the Super 35mm crop and others, that will make it interesting for broadcasters and other high-end productions. And by the way, please also check out my FX6 interview with Jan from Sony to hear their thoughts about that differentiation. But for a huge number of indie filmmakers, the FX6 will be enough. No, in fact, it will be better and the more versatile choice. The Sony FX6 is simply a frustratingly good camera. Now, does anybody want to buy my FX9? Anyway, jokes aside, thanks for watching. Stay tuned to CineD for more news and reviews about cinema making technology. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.